Good morning, everyone, and welcome from London and around the globe. And welcome to our panel discussion here this morning, um, which will be around regulatory changes in the UK and EU post 2020. Uh, my name is John Dunn, I'm the Director General of the UK's largest trade association, the UK VIA. And joining me on the panel here today, we have Clive Bates. And Clive is the Director of Counterfactual Public Policy Consulting. And uh, he has a long tenure in public policy and spent six years as Director of Action for Smoking and Health here in the UK. I've also got Damien Bove, and Damien is Managing Director of ADEX Medical a leading global player in the compliance and testing world. And Damien is also one of the two members of the UK VIA that sit on the board um, of the British Standards Institute um, and their committees. And he also chairs the UK VIA's internal standards group um, uh, within our organization. We have Lee Bryan. Um, Lee is managing director of Arcus Compliance here in the UK, a leading regulatory and compliance company dealing with both the vaping sector and CBD. And Lee is also a board member of the UK VIA. And finally, we have Dustin Dalman. And Dustin is chairman of the Independent European Vape Alliance, or EIVA, as well as managing director of InnoSig's e-cigarette wholesale business in Germany. Um, so today's session will last for roughly about 45 minutes, and it's designed to be as interactive as possible <laughs> with and so please feel free to ask any questions as we go along um, and we'll endeavour to answer them for you. So we're going to kick a quick look at what's happening in the UK with Brexit and the tobacco uh, and products regulate, related products regulation, sorry, or TOPR for short. Um, obviously, the main focus for us here at the UK VIA at the moment is getting ready um, for the Department of Health and Social uh, review of the tobacco and relative products regulations which should be coming up here in December. Um, now that, that uh, review needs to be uh, carried out by May 2021. Now Clive I believe you have um, also submitted um, uh, a policy paper, our submitting policy paper, um, the TOPR. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is this is an initiative with the New Nicotine Alliance, um, which is the consume, main consumers organisation um, in the UK, and I uh, work on a pro bono basis as an advisor to them to help them, you know, have their voice and so on. So, essentially, we saw an opportunity around, um, you know, three of the government's big priorities. First of all, having some something to say about Brexit that isn't a total unmitigated disaster. Um, secondly, something on the levelling up agenda, which is this idea that they want to raise people who, you know, quite poor lives out of poverty, particularly in the north. And then thirdly, the uh, tobacco control plan, which aims to obsolete smoking by 2030. So we put those three things together and came up with a set of proposals, which I would call like tobacco harm reduction max, which is what, if you were really serious about obsoleting smoking by 2030, what are the things that you can now do that you couldn't do uh, under the current EU directives? And therefore, in theory, at least, we will be free to do in Great Britain, maybe not in Northern Ireland, um, from um, the 1st of January onwards, if the government wants to re-regulate in this area. So there's a submission with 10, with some information and a sort of detailed case, well, not too detailed, a reasonably accessible case for each of the 10 proposals. And more or less, they cover areas like, well, if the ban on snooze is always, and always has been, always will be ridiculous, to ban the product that is uh, responsible for the low level of smoking in Sweden. Um, uh, things like lift the 20 milligram limit on milligrams per milliliter limit on nicotine strength, that's a barrier to innovation and potentially better products in the future. Um, go back to just having the commission uh, on advertising practice 
advertising standards authority rules for all forms of advertising um, uh, and lift the lift the EU bans on advertising for vaping and uh, also for low risk tobacco products. I mean, we're very much in the camp that says the key difference in the market is not between tobacco products and nicotine products, but between combustible products and non combustible products. And therefore things like heat not burn and smokeless tobacco, um, nicotine pouches and vaping products all ought to more or less be treated as a single broad category from a public health and regulatory point of view. Um, same with warnings. I mean, the warnings are ludicrous. So we want to try to have warnings that are turned into consumer messaging, which says, you know, sw encourage switching uh, rather than um, um, warning people, scaring them about addiction or whatever. Same across all of those products. <clears throat> then uh, communication of risk. Um, so this borrows an idea that was developed in Canada in which instead of as nobody being able to say anything, the government would approve a series of generic statements uh, about say vaping that any vaping company could use in its uh, marketing that were kind of go government approved sort of sort of thing that Public Health England says about them, but manufacturers can't say. Um, <clears throat> then we get rid of some of the daft things in the directive, you know, the sort of harassment of consumers via container and tank sizes. Um, you know, some of, the, some of that stuff just makes no sense whatsoever. So we would, we would definitely argue uh, against that, get rid of it, hopefully make life easier for consumers. Quite an interesting one on leaflets. I mean, there's a fairly pointless leaflet that goes into, supposed to go into vaping products under the, um, uh, under the directive. We would, we would specify what information needs to be communicated, not whether it goes on a leaflet or not, but also as part of that, we'd switch to having pack inserts in cigarettes that were promoting vaping or heated tobacco products. Okay, so, so you would allow the, prom the cross promotion of a safer product from a cigarette product and either mandatory insertions by the government promoting generic packaging, sorry, not generic packaging, pr promoting generic categories or initiatives by the private sector to promote its own, um, uh, you know, low risk products from, you know, from its cigarette products. And um, then I think finally, just uh, a sensible regulatory framework for all of these products that sort of works on a risk proportionate uh, basis. And that would mean bringing in, you know, regulation for nicotine pouches um, and, and sort of harmonizing across the piece with the main determining factor on how regulation is applied being combustion versus non-combustion rather than tobacco versus non-tobacco or, or on some sort of ad hoc basis. So that's more or less what the proposals are. Uh, hopefully those will feed into options that will be put out for consultation. I'm sure the department won't just see our letter and go, yes, thanks, thanks folks, we'll do all that. Um, but what we're hoping is that some of those ideas will enter the consultation that begins in December and therefore the wider community will have a chance to have a say about them. I know we're just finalizing our um, our policy paper as well, but it sounds like it's going to be broadly in line with what you've just discussed. Um, I think with Brexit, there is an opportunity, I think, for the UK government to make changes that they've promised uh, would be the result of Brexit. Um, and I think this might be a, a quick win for them um, to make some sensible changes. Um, Lee and uh, Damien, do you see, um, uh, obviously with Brexit coming up, any issues that um, manufacturers, for instance, from the US really need to be aware of? I know we now have a, a strange situation where Northern Ireland may be treated differently than the rest of the UK. From a regulatory standpoint, what do you think are the challenges that businesses are going to face doing business in the UK? Um, do you 
you want me to go with this, Damien, or do you want? To... You can go first for like, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, to be honest, uh, you know, as one of the touch points for the MHRA, uh, I was speaking to them last week or the week before on this, and realistically, the, the short to medium term, there's not really going to be any major changes or anything for manufacturers to worry about. The obviously the UK. Uh, the MHRA, well, I say UK, I should use the, the correct terminology now, Northern Ireland or NI and GB as we're going to be known as for these uh, particular uh, reasons. The MHRA will have its own uh, portal, whereas Northern Ireland will be remaining under the EU CHEG portal. So for any new notifications to Northern Ireland, you will still have to use the EU CHEG system. And for any, um, for looking at any uh, legacy uh, products, you'll still have to check those products through the EU check system. Whereas for the UK, any new notifications, you'll still have to, you'll have to push through the new MHRA system. And then the, uh, any legacy data that was in the UK will be pulled across from the uh, EU check system and be stored in the new system. So realistically, in terms of selling and regulatory compliance, there's not really going to be much change. There's no change to the packaging. We're still under CLP. It's more about being uh, for for any changes, particularly for the for the uh, in in England, uh, Wales, and Scotland, or GB as it's known. You'll just have to look and work through the uh, the new system. So other than that there isn't going to be massive impact, as I say, in the short to medium term for manufacturers. It's just there's, a, there's an extra hoop to jump through for your notifications when they, because of the split between uh, GB and Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, yeah, I concur exactly with uh, Finn Lee's just said. There's, um, I think there's going to be a few disconnects immediately with Europe, which... Um, and not so much changes that are going to occur in the UK, but changes that are occurring in Europe, such as Central Poisons Register, um, covering, coming into force with UFI codes. Something's going to come into force in the UK probably next year. It's very similar by the sounds of it. I've not had anything concrete. So hopefully it'll be, a, I mean, the UK Poisons Register will accept a UFI code along with when you send them your MSDS sheet. So there's some alignment already occurring and hopefully it'll continue to align nicely. Um, I know uh, MHRA have put draft guidance up for bringing quality management and quality batch release um, as part of the regulation, but they've been unable to put that into action because they're constrained by the EU keg and some of the regulations. So there's no, they can't really make changes to the XMLs. Um, some of the reporting they would like on that. So they may have freedoms to instigate some of these quality management uh, changes they'd like to see, such as mandatory stability studies and things like that. Um, but again, the, I don't think these are going to change. They're going to happen overnight. These are going to be longer term things that are going to come in. So it's just a, a watching brief and being aware of the subtle differences in the of but there are those sort differences that exist anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree there. I think there's been some frustration from an enforcement perspective, particularly from the MHRA, um, because they haven't been able to make the changes and enforcements that they would have liked to have done. But my understanding is that their new system is going to automate a lot of the checks that they were doing manually, obviously constrained by manpower, um, so when you actually make a new sub uh, uh, submission, you will, the, the system will verify it automatically. You'll make your payment and then it only human interaction only comes in after payments being made. So there's going to be a lot of automatic checks through particular, well, in the UK anyway, I don't think there's going to be any changes to the EU check system from what I understand at this point, but that's going to impact the, the tox side of things um massively and they're going to be able to check that automatically whereas it wasn't being checked so uh for example you could have 
uh, and, and the CAS uh, specifically. So you could have um, incorrect CAS or missing CAS data in the EU CHEG system, and it wasn't verified through that system, whereas the UK system will actually verify um, the data prior to it going through to any human interaction. So, and they should, they're actually going to be able to turn that back on existing notifications, and I believe that's already happening. Um, so we may see some products that uh, perhaps where the submissions weren't complete, even going for as far back as 2016. Um, so there's a lot of companies that perhaps are under the impression that their submissions are good, but the new system may highlight the fact that they aren't, in fact, up to par. So we may see some, some changes there, but the, the MHRA um, and the UK in particular are pro-vaping, so I think that, that, that we're not going to see a draconian change in the way that uh, the approach, but I still think that we're going to see some um, products that are in the market that shouldn't be, or the, the data is missing from those submissions that are there. Um, we've got a question actually come in from Patrick Griffin. Um, is there a danger now that given the coronavirus situation that the, and all the other problems that the UK government is facing, that coming up with the better vaping regulations will be placed on the back burner? And if so, is there anything that we can do as an industry to try and ensure that this does not happen? Can I go? Yeah. Who's got the uh, crystal ball on that one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I was just typing an answer in. Sorry, go ahead. I was just I was just typing an answer into that one uh, on on the Q and A when when you when you raised it. So, um, uh, it, I mean, it's definitely a danger that the government there's a, there's several dangers with getting uh, a reform agenda uh, through the um, through the government for better vaping regulations. Um, the first is. That we won't be able to diverge that much from the EU directives anyway. Um, we, that will depend on the nature of the deal, if there is one that's agreed with the EU in the next, you know, couple of weeks or so, or whenever they get round to doing it. So it's not clear at the moment whether we'll have the, 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 if you like, the flexibility to diverge. And even if we do have the flexibility, whether we will choose to use the flexibility if it comes at a price, for example, if it means that tariffs are applied if you diverge from the EU. Um, secondly, the question is, if they're going to um, show benefits of Brexit, do they really want to do that in an area that would be as controversial as this? You know, the idea that the first, the first thing that you do with Brexit is hand over some new freedoms to the sort of tobacco and vaping industry. You know, you could see the PR difficulties of handling of that, if that's what the Brexit dividend looks like. Um, and then I think probably thirdly is just how much appetite there is in the uh, Department of uh, Health and Social uh, care to actually diverge, you know, whether they think these ideas are actually good ideas or whether they're still trapped in this kind of much more medical model of smoking cessation where everybody is, you know, corralled into local authority or NHS services and, uh, you know, kind of given treatment to stop smoking, which I don't think is a particularly good way of doing it. Um, so there's a lot of barriers there. The answer to the question of what to do about it is get very heavily engaged in the consultation when it comes out, uh, putting good responses, uh, mobilize uh, networks, uh, get customers, uh, get consumers, uh, get local politicians to say there's something positive here. Uh, I, you know, risk of tooting our own horn. I think the in terms of how you make the arguments to this government, in terms of Brexit leveling up, not costing anything, taxpayers anything, being you know good for the household budget of poor people and all of this sort of stuff. Bringing those arguments to the fore, I think is the, is the way to go with this. I'll leave it there. I think I'll add to that, is, you know, one of the things that, that we are concerned about as well is, is whether they rubber stamp in the current regulations and just say that, you know, we're done with it. Um, 
So it's going to be very interesting to see, I think, on this public consultation, just how robust that consultation is actually going to be. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think we're in a bit of a wait, wait and see pattern here. As Clive pointed out, you know, we, we could have a deal that changes the picture within weeks here. Um, uh, or we could be in a situation where we, uh, we crash out of the EU on, on the, the mm. 31st. And, and we're entering a, a black hole at that stage as, as to what we'd be doing anyway. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting time, I think. Um, you know, the other, the other thing as well that we're keeping a close eye on um, is around the, Scot the Scottish devolved administration. So they're you know, indicating that they may, may consult next year on regulations as well, specifically around things like advertising. Um, so we'll be definitely keeping a, a close eye on that. Um, but, you know, it's not only the UK that has things happening. Um, obviously, our European partners, uh, are, even though we're straying a little bit from them, um, have the, the TPD review coming up. Dustin, what's happening uh, in your neck of the woods with Europe? Yeah, we have also some, um, let's say, difficulties to handle. Um, overall, we can say um, it does not. Right, our changes are not related to the Brexit. Um, you know, in Europe, the um, Tobacco Product Directive um, applies for our products, which is um, which says something about, for example, the bottle size, the nicotine level, uh, chloromethyl size, and things like that. And these. This most important framework and law for whole Europe is at the moment to be reviewed or is reviewed by the Commission. They are doing that right now. And so far they are, they, they talk to stakeholders from the industry, like our association, and um, try to find out what the current TPD um, did in the markets and how it is going. They also asked scientists for an opinion. They created their own group, or they formed an own, own, own group of scientists, which gave a feedback from a scientific view. Um, of course, we are not satisfied with that. In Europe, it's totally different to the UK. Um, most of the politician decision makers and also the scientists that are here by them are very against our product and um, want to handle it in the same way like the combustible cigarette, which is a problem since many years. And it will become a problem when they have a look on the TPD and will update it. And the scientific review, it's the SKIA report. It's at the moment just a um, um, preliminary um, paper. It's the opinion. We had the opportunity to give answers um, to answer to that paper. We did that with the help of scientists. You can overall say that this paper is um, a pretty bad base for a review of the TBD. Um, the commission um, is in the lead to draft the update of the, of the TBD. And what they did, what, they, what we see in the paper is that they do not choose a risk-based approach. They choose a hazard-based approach. Um, means that they just look at the risks of these products. Um, it's of course generally um, welcome when there's an initiative to look at the new scientific evidence, which is always good for, for the e-cigarette because it's, there's much more scientific evidence that the e-cigarette helps people to get rid of the combustible cigarette and, and improves the, the, the feeling and, and, and in many ways the life of smokers. And it's the important and famous 95% less harmful. And um, but what they what the commission do and what these reports say is they just look on the risk. They see no chances chances in this product category. They did no comparison with the combustible cigarette. So at the end, there's a very bad outcome. They, for example, say that there is a strong evidence um, on the gateway effect for young people that will start their nicotine career with the help of the e-cigarette and then switch from the e-cigarette to the tobacco cigarette. Um, but the crazy thing is the numbers in Europe, nowhere in Europe, um, give a proof to that. They used in this part of the paper 
um, numbers from the US market, where we have a total situ different situation. The tobacco directive is at the same time, I, I would not say it's not everything bad on it. It's good. It gives a, for me as a, as a, as a company owner, it gives a good feeling or made it, the, 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 made it possible to invest in this business. We know um, what is allowed, what is not allowed. We do not have a problem in Europe with the 20 milligram um, nicotine level. Um, or with the bottle size, of course, it makes no sense from, from different perspectives, but at the end it's good. But what we see now is that there's a raising discussion in many um, member states about banning flavors. We are actually taking care of Denmark, which the country is, is at the moment the biggest threat. It's a small country, but it it's, has a good standing in Europe. Same as in the Netherlands, we already have um, member states that um, banned flavors, and this can have an effect on the TPD uh, through the um, European Council. And yeah, to short it up, um, they look at the TPD too. They will work on the draft of the new version within the next month. And from what we see, we do not expect something good for our industry. Perfect. Um, Damien and Lee, you know, what do you see as being the biggest regulatory challenges for the foreign companies operating in the EU? And, and what have you guys been doing to get your clients ready for those? So there's, there's all this kind of separation of the Brexit thing. That's, that's one part of it. Getting um, companies up to speed with the changing regulations. So, um, around short field regulation in Germany, for instance. Um, we, there's a constant challenge for companies to um, get their safety data sheets up to standard. We, we see a lot of companies that are coming in with very substandard safety data sheets from a European perspective. And the rules are they're drafted differently. Um, and they're, they're using these to reduce their transport costs because they're, they're having to compact them in a cheaper fashion if they're um, if, depending on how they draft the safety data sheets and things like that. So it's kind of some of this corner cutting that you see and then when you work with companies and the companies that we've not really dealt with to date because they've been short fill companies um, largely now they're seeing their some of the European markets regulating the short fill they're, we're starting to see this um, there's a significant number of the US flavor houses have been giving data out previously to support TPD regulation. But now as they've moved into their own regulation in the US with the PMTA, um, that data has come under spotlight. And we've seen a lot of reformulation or updates, um, i.e. where the data has been clearly manipulated in the past to suit. So they've changed the formulation as it's written, but not as they've made it. Um, and we're seeing a lot of companies that products are suddenly containing banned substances um, and they need to reformulate because, and, and companies need to have an awareness of these data updates that are coming in where, where we catch it within our system. So if we make a, we get new data from the manufacturers of flavors, we can update it and it flags the products that are, that suddenly contain an illegal, sub, a banned substance. Um, but companies are, aren't routinely monitoring for these kind of changes with their suppliers. And that, so they're finding some of these things are taking them quite by surprise. And they're having to reformulate products that they've already done the regulation on. They've gone to all the expense of doing the compliance work. All the, well, and the, they've invested in marketing around flavors and they're finding they can't recreate the same product. And it's causing a lot of problems. Uh, but this comes down to really basic good stewardship right in the first place. Um, choosing <laughs> flavor houses that have a, that can provide credible data um, and not being tempted to put, put corners. But I don't think this is a particularly doing business in Europe issue, more of a, the glo an issue that affects a lot of the global vape industry. Yeah, I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly there. The, the industry at large uh, you know, the, the term product stewardship has been absent in the industry 
for a long, long time. Um, and as the, particularly in Europe, where, you know, where um, the regulations are maturing and the member state regulators are, their, their education levels are increased and they're now uh, enforcing on things that they weren't doing three or four years ago. So it's not that there's been any change in the regulation, it's simply that these issues are being found. And as Damien said, there's a lot of people who, our industry has been very, very adept at sidestepping regulations and changing products to, to stay outside of the regulations and never more so than once TPD uh, came into force that everybody changed to a short fill. Um, so there was, you know, decisions made to sidestep. And there was also some, some ignorance that people didn't realize that just by not having nicotine in a product doesn't mean that you're exempt from having uh, an SDS because there could be other chemicals within the product that drive a hazardous classification. So I think that as the enforcement has increased, and it's still nowhere near where it needs to be, but as the enforcement has increased, it's forced people to really reevaluate and look at things from the base level, the recipe. And that means working with flavor houses that provide green lists or, or white lists, whatever they, they, they term them as, and making sure that before you start spending money on product stewardship and compliance, your product is clean and ready for that market. And that's something that uh, both Damien and myself in our respective companies are, are quite hot on, making sure that you're looking at everything at the base level to make sure that you're not wasting any money um, on uh, taking your product to market without it being compliant. And one thing that I'm really hot on is people really not need to start the, the industry is itself has been fantastic at, at marketing itself it's a, we've got some marketing geniuses in the industry but they really need to start thinking about having a compliance budget and spending the same amount of money on their compliance that they would on their marketing um, and to be fair a lot of the bigger companies are now doing that because of the enforcement that we're seeing and hopefully what as, as the member states start cranking things up, we will start seeing a thinning of the market and those guys that are left are the ones who are doing it right, the responsible manufacturers and the responsible retailers. Yeah. I think just to brought up a, a very good point um, earlier on with regards to short fills. Um, do we see or do we think that short fills um, with, with the new regulations you look at the regulations will be brought under the same testing regime that nicotine containing liquids are at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's already a legal requirement um, in the UK under the general product safety regulation. Just because you've got no nicotine in it doesn't exempt you from being a T, from keeping the standards of TPD. Um, you, you default to the nearest harmonized standard for an unregulated product. Um, that can be a difficult sell when you you know for some companies they don't they don't they feel they, they don't want to do that go through the testing but as we've seen also there's, there's you know Germany um, Greece Austria all these the regulating and the Netherlands the con the match you got nicotine or not they still want it regulating and you know and I think that's a trend that you're just going to spread I don't see why it wouldn't um, and it, it it's it's clear that it should be they should be covered by the same regulation um the the nicotine's not the from a vapors risk perspective it's not the nicotine that's, that's driving a lot of the risk it's the, it's the flavor compounds um so what so it just seems foolhardy to not include zero nicotine products within that regulatory framework um the the, the rules allow for that with already. It's just a case of countries choosing, well, you know, if you could consider a short fill as a component of an electronic cigarette and bring it under the regulation without any, any rule changes or law changes. Um, it's just down to the will to do it, I think. Um, and, um, and as we've seen in Germany, these changes will happen and companies need to move very quickly to keep up. But those companies that, we, we found a lot of companies already done the testing 
So it was just a, an administrative process. Um, the good companies, the, the good companies, probably not the right word, but the, the, the companies have a better handle on their regulatory stuff, infrastructure. But already we're already there, and it's just an administrative job. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's it's not gonna it's never gonna wind back. It's only gonna wind forward. I've got a, a, a question for you. Um, it'd be interesting to know your opinion on it. With the disbanding or the changes with Public Health England, um, you know, obviously the vaping community around the world looks at the UK as being that beacon of hope or that beacon of sanity when it comes to uh, a regulatory viewpoint um, and a medical viewpoint on vaping. Do you think the changes we're going to see with Public Health England might be a problem with that? Or might change that viewpoint. Are you asking me, John? Yes, I'm Clive. Yes. Okay. Um, actually, I think um, after the theatrics of disbanding Public Health England um, over the summer, um, you know, so, some sort of dead cat strategy on COVID nineteen. Um, I think all the bits of it that are not going into the infectious diseases agency are going to end up somewhere else and there'll be another agency that will have a different plaque on the door but it will look a lot like Public Health England. I think uh, particularly if they're going to push forward on this plan to you know obsolete cigarettes by 2030 they can't they can't dismantle the capacity in government that's supposed to be pushing that forward throughout the country I mean that would be a bit daft. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about that, actually. Um, I'm pretty confident that it will uh, continue. And that also the series of reports that they've done, the ones that started in 2015, and they've been done every year, every couple of years since, those will also continue through to a final one in 2022, when they're going to revisit the sort of 95% number and see where they've got to with that. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably sanguine about that. The, the, the bigger question is whether they'll do anything interesting on regulation to really get a push behind the reduced risk alternatives um, and to, to really encourage people to switch from smoking using every, every lever that they've got. That, that's the big one for me in the UK anyway. Outside the UK, the big one is what kind of vandalism is done with the TPD. Absolutely. Um, we're down to our last five minutes here, so we'll take a quick look at, uh, I think we've only got one question or two left. Let me have a look here. Seems like one or two more popped in. Um, but we see increases on tax on vaping products in the UK, and I think that's probably also going to be the same for Europe. Um, what do we think taxation, guys? What do we think is going to happen with that? Austin, what do you think? Um, the Commission currently has a look um, how to tax, tax e-cigarette and other um, products like um, heat not burn products. And we are awaiting a draft from the Commission in the first half of 2021. The good thing is, um, that's a bad thing, but that we expect it. The good thing is that the European Council and pointed out that the tax regime has to do a differentiation between um, tobacco cigarette and other products that are less harmful. That is a good solution. We as expect that in the first step they agree on the definition. Um, what will be taxed? Of course, from my point of view, it will be the nicotine. I hope it will be just the nicotine, not the non-nicotine um, um, liquids. And then we hope to see um, a tax that is in the first period zero. We have already, I think it's eight or nine member states that have uh, their own tax rules when it comes to e-cigarettes. But for example, markets like here in Germany or in France do not have a tax at the moment. So we hope it's, in, it's, it's, in, it's really important for this, yeah, yes, um, pretty new and, and small and medium-sized enterprise businesses um, a tax would be a massive workload, and of course, it will make the product less attractive. But we, we think there will come a draft, as I said, pretty soon. And I think from the UK's perspective, you know, we've we've had that uh, threat knocking at the door a couple of times, 
uh, and the government have pushed back on it, saying that you know they're they're not interested in doing that. Um, I think you know they would find it uh, to be counterproductive if they're trying to get more people to switch out of smoking to make the product more expensive. Um, in fact, you know some would make an argument that uh, taxation should be reduced if the government uh, is is pushing vaping as somewhat of a, a stop smoking product or a smoking cessation product, then it should be perhaps uh, you know VAT rated at five percent like other nicotine replacement therapies out there. Um, so I don't think there's a huge a huge threat of that. Um, there was a couple of other quick questions came up. Um, do we think it's possible for the UK to follow the US's flavor ban? Um, again, I think in my opinion, I think it's it's always a threat that's out there. Um, you know, but I think the UK takes a more scientific approach rather than a moralistic approach. And there is plenty of arguments out there and statistics out there that show just how effective I think flavors are um, to not only help people to make the switch, but also to uh, to make sure that they don't switch back. Um, so I, I I don't see a huge a huge issue there. Um, I think Dustin, though, there's probably a little bit more of a push for that, maybe on your your, your side of things, though, isn't there? Yeah, it's, um, it's a totally moral approach, like you mentioned. It's the opposite, like it is uh, in the UK. Um, here, they did not found any reason to ban flavors when it comes to to the danger to the people who use it, who use these cigarettes. It's more the approach to attract minors, and it can attract minors um, or adolescents. So therefore, we think here it is a really, really big threat that is getting bigger from what we see from month to month. And I think finally, the, the, the last question we could probably cover, um, there was one to hear about, you know, why weren't vape shops in, uh, in the UK deemed as being essential? Um, I think the main reason, at least initially, was that the government felt that by allowing um, the continued use of online purchasing and uh, purchasing of vaping products, at least limited selection of them from the convenience sector, um, where people were going for food anyway um, was a safer bet uh, for them. However, I think, you know, in hindsight, that probably wasn't the best decision to make. Um, and especially here as we went into the second lockdown, um, unfortunately, they, they, they deemed us non-essential again. Um, uh, you know, we, during that period of the first lockdown, we saw figures yesterday that indicated that people um, actually reverted back to smoking. Um, so I know it's something that uh, I've been very uh, active, uh, actively involved with. Um, we've been meeting with uh, MPs and ministers um, who were, are quite vocal that they don't agree with that situation. And I personally have written to um, all of the ministers and government departments involved in that. Um, but we haven't been success successful yet. Um, I know Europe had uh, some countries that did have some success around that, but again, it's not it's not a consistent uh, consistent approach. But I think it, it's mainly around governments trying to do the best they can. I think with a situation that they don't understand, um, uh, and unfortunately, some of the decisions I think they make are a little uh, a little skewed. But I think we're just, uh, we're just unfortunately out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank Voxbo for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to have a chat with everybody today. I'd like to thank my guests for giving up their time and joining us from around the world. Um, and I hope uh, those who are viewing found it uh, to be informative. And again, thank you everybody. And we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Everybody.